introduction, Paul, or shall I dive right in? I can, I can do a very uh, brief introduction on that side. So welcome everyone. My name is Paul Lindbergh. I am the Assistant Director of Global Engagement. I'm based in New York City and I work with the Columbia alumni across Europe, including the Greece group. Uh, we have over 10,000 alumni across, across Europe. Um, and of course our Greece community and many of you who are joining across Europe and also in Turkey. Um, I will start off and give a brief introduction to Lena who's been really gracious to offer this lecture to the larger group. Um, and I will say Yasu to, the, to our fellow Columbia alumni in Greece. Uh, we'll we have already started recording the program for according to GDPR, we will record this. Today's program will be an insightful 30 minute presentation followed by a Q&A. So if you have any chat messages or questions to ask Lena, you can add them into the chat, but we'll be answering the questions closer to the end. Lena Papalexo Pulu is a 1989 SIPA alumnus. She's also a CAA board member and the president of CAA Greece. Lena will be speaking today on higher education in the post COVID era a view of transformation ahead. Lena is also the vice president of the Desmos non for profit organization, a pioneering hub for charitable giving. During the last decade, Lena has dev devoted herself to serving the common good, focusing on education and engagement. A passionate believer in education as a force for a, be for a better future, she conceived and co implemented I Care and Act, a visionary educational program that has already empowered 5% of Greek students to become civic minded. She is an active collaborator with the Ministry of Education in Greece a member of Columbia University CA board, as I mentioned before, and a member of the Tufts University Board of International Advisors. In October of 2019, she was appointed to reposition in Greece, a team which advises the prime minister of Greece on the country's image and strategic planning. Could everyone please mute themselves? Um, finally, prior to what she held she held her current positions. Um, she had various positions um, at the, with, at, within the European Union, Merrill Lynch, Johnson & Johnson, as well as Concept SA, where she served as a president and CEO. Lena is, is fluent in four languages and holds a BA with honors in economics and business from Lafayette College, a master's of international affairs from Columbia University, and an advanced executive management degree from IMD, IMD. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Lena. Thank you for, for joining us. Thank you very much for your uh, introduction, Paul. Um, I would like to start by making a couple of disclaimers. Um, one is that the, uh, the views that I express are my own and they're based on my involvement with higher educational institutions and my own curiosity, and they do not necessarily reflect those of the uh, Columbia Alumni Board I sit on. And the other one is that the topic that's chosen is way uh, too vast and too complex to cover all aspects in a few minutes. Uh, so I've chosen to focus on changes that I think are important and could interest you. Um, and I've also chosen to focus uh, on the Anglos here in the US. Obviously there are many more other changes that we could talk about. Now, um, I'm totally passionate about education as those of you who know me realize. And that's because I fundamentally believe that the quality and the reach of our education is the foundation of our future. And I also happen to believe that right now, higher education as we know it today is entering an era of transformation and the better we realize it, the sooner we realize it, the, the better off we'll be. So in order to uh, discuss the changes, we have to define our starting point. So in order to define that, I would say that we are right now um, at the end of a golden era for higher education. Uh, now, there's not much of a consensus as to when the golden era started. Uh, some would say World War II, some would say the 60s or the 90s, but there isn't a consensus on when it's finishing, and that's pretty much now. Now, in this golden era, there's been extraordinary growth for higher education, primarily driven by economic prosperity. Um, higher education as a sector worldwide grew by a factor of six from 1970 until 1213, while population in the world only grew by 1.9. 
Um, there's been a growing demand for students in the US, both domestically and internationally. It's a lot of government backing in forms of subsidies, loans, tax breaks, and hiring policies. And also there's a social consensus on the value of higher education. So as a result, during this golden era, an elite system morphed into a high participation one, indeed some would even say a mass participation one, where one out of three youths globally, or three out of four in the US and Europe, actually enroll in, 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 in colleges. As a matter of fact, from 95 until last year, the percent of students, youths that have, um, that are enrolled in colleges grew from 60% to close to 40%. There's also prestige associated with, um, with and soft power associated with degrees, and and this whole uh, evolution has ex has helped the exchange of people and ideas internationally. Now it would be quite unfair to say that everything was peaches and cream and along came COVID and destroyed everything. That is far from true. There were issues forecasting the end of this golden era because higher education as a sector, I think, missed the mark on a number of important issues. One of them is that there's diminishing correlation between societal needs and students' qualifications, as we can see from the number of um, graduates that were graduates from good institutions but couldn't find a job, while at the same time, there were a number of companies that couldn't fill some of their positions. One thing that is the most, one of the most important ones that from the ones I've listed there is the perceived decreasing return on education as tuition fees and student debt rose. Now, um, indulge me just for one minute as I throw out some, 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 some numbers. According to the OECD expenditure um, per student in higher education doubled after inflation within the last 30 years. And student loans and debts have exploded, especially in the US. It grew from about 330 30 billion in 12-13 um, uh, to a whopping 1.7 trillion last year. Now this is a huge number. More than 43 million people in the US still owe money for their education, even if they're a lot older, and many of them are having a hard time paying it off. There are also other issues such as the system's inability to scale up under the current largely face-to-face -face models. Several universities' organizational or cultural inability or cultural unwillingness to follow the digital revolution. And there's also diminishing social consensus on the value of universities in the Anglo-Saxon world. More than half of the people uh, in the UK, for example, think that the money that you spend on tuition to get a college degree is not worth what it gives back to you afterwards. And this consequently, there's shrinking government support. So and, and, unless all of that was enough, along came COVID, and you all know what COVID uh, implied, the disruption and the distancing and the costs and, and, and all the issues involved. So with that as a framework, let's talk about higher education after COVID and what are the changes that we should expect to see. Before talking about the five important changes that I see, I feel compelled to talk about the most obvious one. And the most obvious one is financial stress. The day after higher education as a sector will be dealt a significant financial blow. Uh, total en enrollments are expected to drop, reducing tuition revenue. Already last year in the US, the sector, the higher education sector dwindled by 3.6%. Now, that being said, I, will very, uh, I would very much like to add that the burden will not be unevenly spread. So top ranking institutions are currently seeing a rise in application. As a matter of fact, um, maybe it had to do with the waiving of standardized testing, but top institutions, including Columbia, have seen a big increase uh, in the applications that they have received. But still, overall, the sector will reduce. And if we looked at the, the, the sector again as a whole, I think it is obvious that we're seeing at increase, an increase in operational expenses, uh, both the existing ones and new ones, such as um, the ones that are related to health, the new platform, IT, and so on. Um, government and state funding is decreasing, and several donors will have less to donate. So all of this financial distress will affect universities to varying degrees, including their functioning, their academic curricular, the quality of education, and unfortunately, even the viability of several academic institutions. 
I was reading um, an article the other day by John Kroger, uh, who was for many years the, the president of Reed College, and he claims that 1,000 academic in-person institutions are going to go bust before the end of the COVID era. That's out of 4,000, so basically one out of four. I, I, I think that's a bit too pessimistic, and I do not foresee that happening, but there will be a number of institutions that will not make it. And by the way, I do not think that that will be limited to in-person academic institutions. We should expect to see some online institutions suffering too. There are about 5,000 of them in the US, and uh, most of them do not have a strong brand name, and they offer their courses for a certain tuition fee as more and more top name universities are offering courses for free, it is hard to see how why anybody would go to a no name university and have to pay for it while they can get some of the top name university courses for free. So all of these issues may persist and universities will need to devise new sustainable financial models. Now, one of the most interesting trends that we're going to see after COVID, I think, is that the symbiosis of in person and online learning uh, will be here to stay. I don't think we're going to go to um, either in-person or online again. I think higher education from now on as a whole will adopt a hybrid model. So we all know that before COVID, it was mostly in-person and online was limited. During the COVID era, that was reversed. I think starting um, September next year and for the next couple of years, in-person will be more prevalent, but maybe not up to the point that it was in, in, in before 2019 and uh, online will become more important. And then eventually after three or four years, we'll see you know, the, the, the new normal, which will have the symbiosis. It'll be a hybrid model from now on. And we will need to hang on to both types of learning because both, both are crucial. In-person allows us to connect. It allows us to connect with institutions. It allows us to connect with instructors, with students. It allows us to feel, it allows us to build relationship. And feeling is important. I mean. Aristotle said that educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. You learn much better when you can feel. So it provides a more holistic experience. On the other hand, online allows us to expand the student base and reach, provide flexibility, shrink, almost annihilate costs. It can be borderless. It increases inclusivity and it democratizes education. So I think we need both. We can expect a debate, including questioning of the traditional in-person Anglo model that we're all used to. We should expect different institutions will choose different answers. There's no right answer for all, adopting models that are appropriate to them. And we should expect our competitive environment to change as universities will be competing with other universities or other academic institutions that may not be exactly um, uh, universities or may have different models and could be in different regions. Another important change that we should expect is the shift from knowledge to soft skills. Now, we've been talking about the shift of focus to soft skills, I think, for a decade or even more, but we haven't seen much of it or as much as we expected 10 years before. I think we're going to start seeing that a lot more. Now, it may not come as a surprise that a lot of employers are looking for primarily things that universities do not directly teach. Uh, such as social skills, emotional intelligence, teamwork, communication, and time management. Uh, it may not come as a surprise also, as PwC is saying, that about 77% of employees are willing to upskill or to retain and maintain employability. What may come as much more of a surprise, though, as The Economist reminds us, is that educators think in the same term. Educators think that the workforce demands of the future will require more soft skills, such as creativity and, solving, and, and problem solving. 79% of them say that soft skills are as important as literacies. 76 that students benefit more from hands-on learning than from formal lectures and 73 percent that learning must take place both inside and outside the classroom and i think that nobody put it better than the head of pisa for the oecd who actually said that the world economy no longer pays you uh, for what you learn the whole uh, for what you know, but because Google knows absolutely everything. The world economy pays you for what you can do with what you know. Now, the World Economic Forum had figured that out a few years back. 
So they ran a meta-analysis research to uncover what are the skills that are needed in the 21st century. And basically what they said that today, education is largely focused on knowledge and acquisition through foundational literacies. <coughs> Excuse me. So those foundational literacies are the basic ABCs, numeracy, scientific, uh, technology, financial, cultural, and civic literacy. But that's what we needed up until now. What we'll need in the future are more competencies. So critical thinking, problem solving, creativity. Creativity is the ability to imagine and devise innovative ways to address problems, communication and collaboration. And then they took it even a step further and said that these competencies must be based on character qualities such as curiosity, initiative, persistence, adaptability, leadership, social and cultural awareness. So basically if I had to sum all of this up, I would say that higher education or any education as a matter of fact, will have to move from anything that a machine can do to anything that is uniquely human. So the purpose of education will shift from helping students learn information to teaching students how to collect, how to interpret, how to apply, and how to use information. Now, before I move from the soft skills um, topic, let me run by you quickly an example of edX. edX, for those of you that may not know it, is a digital platform that um, has a vision to create a world where every learner can access education to unlock their potential without barriers of cost or location. So it's high quality education for all. And it was founded by Harvard and MIT. And right now it's being run by Harvard, MIT, Cambridge, Oxford, and powered by Google and Amazon. They've had more than 110 million enrollments. Now I had the opportunity to meet uh, eMeet uh, a couple of months back, Anand Agarwal, who is the founder in CEO of, um, of edX. And he was basically saying that before COVID, if you looked at the top 15 courses that edX offered, there were no soft skill courses. Everything was pretty much hardcore knowledge. And if you look at the change within 12 months of, of, of COVID, then the top nine courses of edX, three of the most popular ones are specifically related only to soft skill. The number three most popular course is Empathy and Emotional Intelligence at Work, which is a, a, a Berkeley course. And, and Anand believes that this trend is going to continue. Um, I spoke at a, a, a conference a few weeks ago with uh, Jeff Machin Calda. He's the um, CEO of Coursera, which is the largest MOOC in the world. And he was speaking exactly to the same point that soft skills are becoming even more and more important. His favorite course at Coursera is learning how to learn, which is completely soft skills again. Another important change to expect is that we're gonna to move to more stackable modules and lifelong learning. Now, up until now, I think higher education has been more provider centric, okay? It was focused more on the university providing education. It followed a more traditional approach whereby universities offered full-time degrees, students that could afforded a big chunk of time to get the degree prior to starting their career. As time goes by, I think we're going to move to a new, more customer-centric approach of ed units. Now, um, guilty as accused, please forgive me, ed units is not a word. I know I created it, I apologize, it doesn't exist, but reading um, about education units, educational units, you know, people refer to them by all sorts of things. They refer to them as independent courses or modules or certificates or micro-credentials, but basically what it boils down to is education units. So I think we're moving towards a world where units of education will be accessed whenever a student or a learner has the need or the time or the money or, or just the fancy to learn something. So it won't be necessarily at the beginning of their career. So one may take a course to upskill, to retrain for a current job or to reskill for a new job or if they're unemployed or furloughed or if they desire to learn or if they're um, substituting or complementing their schooling. These ed units 
could be stackable. They won't necessarily be stacked, but they could be stackable. So you can add them up. So you can take just one course or you can take many courses that add up to certain certificate or several certificates or courses from different institutions, collaborating institutions that may result a degree. So you could still have a bachelor's degree as soon as you finish high school, but you may just continue taking a course here and there as you need to throughout your life. So education will become a lifelong service. And I think we should expect older students. So in a few years time, we may not be using the term students. We may be using the term learners and it may be more appropriate. And we will see older learners as an increasing number of people will want to integrate learning into their lives as opposed to, inter, uh, to, as opposed to integrate their lives into learning and into degrees and stopping their lives in order to get a, a full-time degree. Another change that we should expect is a move from relative uniformity to increased diversity. I think that if we look, take a snapshot and look at universities today and, 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 and what higher education will be in 10 years, we will see a big difference in terms of diversity. And we'll see diversity in a number of issues. We'll have different education providers. Some of them will be the more traditional, but we'll have new, more corporate ones as more education is delivered by IT virtually. I think we should expect tech companies to enter the market or you can have partnerships. You can have university XYZ powered by Google or ABC. I think we're gonna see different customer categories. Up until now, universities see their clients primarily as individual students, but in the future, I think we'll need to take more into consideration individual learners of different ages, as well as companies, government, and other agencies. I think we're going to see different areas of focus as some academic institutions in order to survive will focus in niche development. And I think we'll also see different methods of delivery, in-person, virtual, augmented reality, synchronous, or asynchronous. One of the area that is, um, could be a hot potato, I guess, and I saw very little uh, in the research that I did, there was very little written, was different instructors. Now, I may not become extremely popular with my academic friends when I say that, but it does make sense. If we're moving from teaching knowledge to teaching soft skills to have to require fewer traditional PhDs and more experiential instructors. As a matter of fact, De La Roca, who is the assistant provost of, of BU of Boston University, was saying that he expects that we're going to move to a multidiscipline teaching team. So we won't just have a professor that will be teaching, but faculty will bring domain knowledge. But that equally important to effective education will be to have a whole team, or to have a process, to have experience design. So the team will be the professor, will be an e-learning designer, technology specialist, a content uh, coach, a social director, a managing correspondent, correspondent, and everything else will be fused. So basically what he was saying is in a world where knowledge is ubiquitous, content expertise will become less important and the process and the experience design will become even more important. And on top of all of that, of course, another factor is artificial intelligence. Already many universities are using artificial intelligence for their learning platforms, and many perceive artificial intelligence to be how we're going to scale up personalized learning. Um, for example, Georgia Tech uh, adopted uh, chatbot teaching assistants uh, over five years ago. They're powered by IBM. So these teaching bot assistants can be anywhere, anytime. They're interactive, they're adapt adaptive to the specific needs of students and they are considered at Georgia Tech to be a big success. And I think we're gonna see more of that. Finally, um, the last trend that I would expect to see is greater globalization, greater inclusion, but I'm afraid there's a risk also for greater inequality. And I know this sounds like, a, like an oxymoron given the greater globalization and inclusion, but allow me to explain. As a larger number of learners, irrespective of their means and location, will have access to free online education, I think it is obvious that we will have increased globalization and greater diversity and inclusion. However, many of us fear that higher education will split in two major segments. 
On one hand, you can have few high quality academic institutions, for example, such as Columbia, that will continue offering traditional, mostly in-person education. Some universities like ours will promote a more physical on-campus experience as part of the whole value proposition. And if the brand name is strong enough, you know, we'll be able to get away with that. But that could be the minority of academic institutions. The other major segment will be a number of virtual hybrid part-time education providers that I'm afraid may be of lower caliber. If this fear comes true, then the privileged and wealthy and maybe a few gifted students when I get scholarships will have who have access to the former will benefit disproportionately fueling increase in inequalities, which are a plague of our times. So to kind of draw to a conclusion, my conclusions for universities um, is that a major transformation of higher education is already underway. It is time to reflect, to decide, to act, and the options are to optimize or to transform. Inertia de facto is not an option, and I say that inertia de facto is not an option in the sense that education is transforming in such fundamental ways that even if an institution decides not to transform itself, not to change, its relative position within the market will change. So in fact, it will have changed. It will be in a different position. So institutions can benefit, sometimes I would say even survive, by proactively reviewing mission strategy and tactics in, in that order, adopting optimal operational model, developing appropriate programming, choosing suitable methods, tools, technologies, establishing collaborations, and making, I'm afraid, very, very tough choices regarding teaching staff, such as right-sizing and reskilling or changing and building teaching teams. It's going to be quite difficult. I mean, how, how, how does one balance treating devoted, knowledgeable staff fairly while making sure that you're offering students the new skills, the new soft skills that they really need? And then, of course, you will need to communicate all of these changes. Which universities will fare better? I think the academic institutions that'll have, well, the obvious ones more, healthy finances, a generous endowment, and maybe even more important, strong fundraising capabilities. Definitely a strong brand will help and a clear specialized niche. Um, flexibility is important. Ability to avoid bureaucracy and adapt and be swift at all levels. But above all, I think the universities that will fare better are the ones that'll have strong leadership. Leadership is more important than ever. And by strong leadership, I think that we need leaders that are visionary, that can see what is happening ahead, that are ready to take really brave decisions, even if sometimes they are unpopular, that are proactive, and they really need to be unifying as the changes ahead are so big that it'll take a team to implement. So in my final slide, conclusions for society as a whole, the reality is that the transformation of higher education to a value-driven lifelong service through digitalization, soft skills and educational units has already started. The pace may not be as fast as it is needed to be. And that because the system is resistant to change, it's hierarchical, it's established and it's resistant to change. And because Currently, we're still not able to reliably measure the outcome of the desired changes. How do you grade a skills course, for example? The risks are great. There are risks for a decreased quality of education, lower value attributed to higher education and educators, and maybe the biggest risk of all, which is greater inequality within the educational system and then by extrapolation to society as a whole. However, the gains are also really important as you will have widespread accessibility to higher education, greater diversity and inclusion, and an increased correlation between educational offerings and student market needs. So I hope that I haven't tired you too much with this presentation. I will stop sharing my screen and open it for discussion. Let me not monopolize uh, this. I'm happy to take any questions, but I would also love to hear your views, whether they are uh, concurring or whether they are conflicting. Please. So let me put the chat box to see if we have 
Any questions? We, we, have, we have someone who's raised their hand for a question, Lena. Uh, Professor Grigoriadis. Yes, yes. I would like to thank you very much for this most interesting presentation. I would like to raise two issues, in fact, that I consider to be quite significant. Uh, the first is the, the role that uh, the so-called adjunctification of higher education faculty is bringing about. Universities are accused of hiring less people in full-time positions and increase, like depend increasingly on uh, PhD students or adjunct professors to cover their teaching needs. And this is considered as a sort of long-term a threat for the quality of teaching, even in the best universities. The second point I would like to raise, and I think it's also quite important, is uh, the involvement of universities, especially in countries like the United States, in these populist wars, like this conflict, uh, the rise of populism and the emergence of universities as elite institutions. Of course, uh, denying uh, the elite nature of universities like Columbia is impossible, right? But on the other hand, the university should not be cornered, in my opinion, in one in the one side of, of this war. It should try to, to make bridges and sort of make sure that this sort of discourse does not, does not become dominant in the country because populism has been a very big menace for countries around the world and in the West. So how is this going to be addressed in your opinion? Thank you. Well, those are two very um, important questions. Um, I, I fundamentally agree with the premise of both of the questions. Yes, um, I think that it is important that in the, now, in order to decrease expenses, uh, a lot of the teaching, uh, more than should, has been moved to teaching assistants and adjunct professors and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think that's only part of the equation. As I said before, a lot of the PhD professors that are actually teaching now have um, gained the right to teach through spending hours in research and behind a computer or in a library and are absolutely wonderful at teaching knowledge, but not all of them are prepared to teach soft skills. So I think that in the uh, near future, not so distant future, even though there will be a lot of resistance to that, I think that we will see a trend towards getting instructors that may not even have uh, PhDs to teach those soft skills. So even though there will be resistance, I think this will happen. And um, I suspect it will be easier to find uh, those uh, instructors. And it, they may not, in, in quotations, cost as much as full PhDs. Or if there's somebody who is somebody who's extremely well known or has made a name for himself in business, they could be, but that would be the exception. So, in a way, a lot of the um, uh, the, the, the adjunct professors could be uh, substituted by them. Time will tell, and it'll be a very different approach for each academic institution. I do not think that there is one formula that applies to everybody, and it depends on, as I said in the end of the presentation. If we, if we see actually higher education moving to two directions and having the two different segments, I think that the first one that will continue with in-person teaching will stick with many more you know, um, top professors um, as, as they have now. Um, and in the other case uh, where it's virtual, they will have fewer. If you have uh, uh, virtual teaching, you can reach many, many more students. You can have fewer lectures as Oxford University um, uh, tried this past year. With one professor, you can reach thousands and thousands of teachers just by, by putting a MOOC online. Um, so that means if you actually can provide and cover the academic needs of many people by having you know, virtual classes like that, maybe that will mean that you will have fewer positions for professors. That's something to take into consideration. Not very optimistic. I'm, I, I wish I had a much uh, more optimistic answer for you. Uh, in terms of populism, uh, I don't know if uh, Mr. De Colmenares would like to, to, to add to the conversation, as I know it's one of his favorite uh, topics. I think that, yes, um, there is um, a, a big fear there, and that um, uh, uh, we, I would like to say we who are involved in education in any way, shape or form, have a duty to try to veer society away 
uh, from populism. Um, uh, and uh, in the past, especially in the US with the last administration, we have seen um, populism being um, used to drive people away from um, uh, higher education. When you have the president of the United States saying that colleges are bastions of radical left and liberalism, uh, and you have the majority of your party eventually agreeing with that, that is, you know, uh, uh, drifting people away from where they, they, they should be, I think. So we should all make a concerted effort to try to move away from populism. Jose Luis, I don't know if there's anything that you would like to add on that topic. I think you're muted. I was, I, I was in trouble reactivating my 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 audio. Well, uh, since you mentioned my 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 name, I will. I'm, I'm in, in fact yes. I'm, I'm um, populism is 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 an area that um, interests me, and and this is why I'm taking this year off uh, to do some some research um, um, online, as a matter of fact. So I can I can make a couple of uh, comments on what it's like uh, studying suddenly online. Um, but um, clearly, uh, populism is is is, is seeking uh, simple solutions to complex uh, problems. Uh, yeah. So, so um, the temptation, the temptation for certain politicians to um, to try and provide simple answers uh, to uh, fears that um, that that um, are in the in the, in the in the midst of the body politic is is is, is always big. So um, clearly, um, um, higher higher learning institutions do do have a challenge because um, they have to ensure that um, the people are educated and 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 in, uh, to understand that certain issues are simply not simple and um, and they're complicated and um, in to understand and and in this regard. Um, the internet is a, is a very valuable tool because uh, because uh, you can you can reach um, uh, a vast um, audience that uh, in normal circumstances you could only you could only you could only have uh, in in presence in in in, in smaller rooms as, uh, as 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 we have had in Columbia or or Harvard or any other uh, other university. Um, 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 during this year, I've been signing up to to lectures online lectures and some of my classmates were in, in the in the antipodes and um, um, arrangements have had to be made to have um, different groups at, at different times um, well um, these things um, these things are, are positive things because uh, as I said you you reach a much wider audience uh, there is a drawback though and and the drawback is is one um, you, you will miss uh, the personal contact uh, you will miss the ability to um, uh, make friends. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but a one year um, on, on uh, online has taught me that you cannot make, um, it's not the same thing. You cannot make friends uh, online. Just as in diplomacy, we say that you cannot make friends with a translator. Same thing with, uh, with the internet. And so this holistic experience and this networking that um, uh, academic institutions provide, Sadly, I'm 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 not very optimistic that uh, the internet will be able to substitute for that. I saw that Ipek Jem had a question. Maybe she's lost connection. Is there anybody else who has a question or a comment? Well, hello, Lena. This is Katharina. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought it was an amazing presentation. Um, it was very, very well thought through uh, the way to, to give us uh, these categories of uh, uh, cases. Um, I, I really agree with the way you've put things and the re research you've done. And uh, I just want to, to point out uh, that I think that the hybrid model that you were mentioning uh, on uh, having teachers that bring knowledge, but also people that bring the, the experience and the, the market aspect, I think is really crucial and the, the empathy and the social skills. But there's so many, so many aspects that, that they teach now that when you get out of the university, you don't know how to apply it in... Uh, 
in the market in the in the industry. So I think a, a hybrid model is really key for uh, for the new era, <laughs> so to say. So I, that's my comment, and thank you so much. Thank you, Dina. Now, this the hybrid, as uh, um, I think, model is 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 very important, and it may go in directions that we don't really anticipate. Um, the provost at Oxford um, was saying, for example, that the the um, switched completely online in uh, the beginning of this year. So uh, they were uh, expecting that they would have big lectures and everything would be online using their best lectures. And then they would have to supplement in small in-person you know, groups that, that could be live. And they thought that that would work the best. But in the end, they saw that that didn't work out because in the large lectures, they, the, um, they couldn't get, they couldn't engage the student base. There was no response from the audience. Well, on the contrary, they found that they could have a substantive one-on-one -on -one tutorial exchange online. So they've decided next year to swap what they did before and to try now that COVID permits to have you know, the big lectures in person and to have the small tutorials online. So I think experience is going to teach us a lot. Yes, of course, I, I really agree, but I, I wanted more to mention the hybrid models that you mentioned also in the educational uh, not only the the face to face or or online, but also the type of uh, professionals, the, the type of people that are going to teach. So someone from the industry. Uh, that's what what I meant. That I thought it was um, uh, really it was a, a new idea for me. I, I I didn't I hadn't thought about it. So I thought it was really interesting. Thank you. Well, let me ask all of you, uh, do you think there's any trend or anything you would expect uh, to happen um, to the future of higher education, any major trends that are not present in this presentation? What, what have I missed? I'd, I'd, I'd be very, very interested. Go ahead. Um, Lena, I, I think I have one comment because uh, I, I did attend a something about the future of New York, um, and there were some kind of urban um, architects talking about the digital deserts that exist within New York City, where there are some people who have significantly slower Wi-Fi, um, and the impact around those risks. Um, I think that sort of increases inequality um, and is an infrastructure issue. Obviously, it's not something higher education can address as a as a institutions but I think that it impacts um, and exacerbates inequality um, across the different parts. That's, that's very true. Um, I see Peck is back and I see four hands raised, but I think if Peck was the one that had raised it first. So, Peck, Jim. Uh, thank you, Lena. Um, I wanted to ask about the, the play between the global and the local. With many, um, bigger players or platforms such as Coursera or such as, uh, you know, uh, big brands, old universities such as Oxford who are, are experts in so many fields, um, being able to reach a global audience. How does that play out, you think, for the local players, the, the state schools and private schools in a given constituency such as Greece or Turkey? How will they be impacted? And what about accreditation? Because usually the accreditation and, um, is provided by um, the local governments, uh, meaning the, 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 the government of a, of a certain state. Um, so I wanted to uh, just pick your brains on that. Yeah, that's Thank a, you. That's a very good question, Ipek. Um, I think that uh, the local players uh, will be impacted uh, significantly over the years by the global ones. Um, uh, just the, the, the CEO of uh, Coursera that was in uh, Greece, and we've spoken of a forum together uh, a few weeks ago, said that there were 350,000 enrollments from Greece to Coursera. I never, I never expected it to be that much. So many, many, many people are already taking uh, courses. So I think that it's something that goes two ways. First of all, a lot of the local universities um, may not be able to have the breadth 
Uh, so uh, the students will be able to take courses globally from other universities around the globe, even if they're in their home country. So they will miss a part of the pie, if I may say. Uh, on the other hand, local universities can become global or they can offer courses globally. I mean, for example, in the, the Greek Minister of Education right now, um, th this year we started English language programs, uh, uh, not only on Greek history and Greek culture and Hellenic studies, uh, but also in business. And uh, we started the first pro uh, program in, for, for, for um, training doctors in the medical field. So there's already discussion about how a local player can offer courses globally. So yes, the local will lose to the global player, but even the local player can become global. So uh, that's in terms of the global versus the local effect. Now, in terms of accreditation, that is a very important point. Um, Initially, uh, the edX and the Corsairs of the world started without really um, uh, accreditation. They weren't thinking they were going to give that. Eventually, they have come to the point where they actually give some accreditation. Uh, edX started without it in the beginning, and they finally do give it now. And um, if you take a course and uh, you do not need accreditation or any certification to prove that you've taken the course, it is totally for free. But if you want to take uh, a piece of paper uh, that, that says you've taken that course, the lowest form of the accreditation, then uh, it costs you something to the tune of, I don't know, $12 or $15 or something like that. So um, this skepticism by some as to the validity, especially when you're taking an online course, was it you actually taking it or not? So I think there is a fair amount of, of a skepticism and in some cases rightly so. But as time goes by, I think it'll become more common and more accepted uh, and people will you know, pick up these little accreditations. And eventually uh, we will see more and more collaborations between um, academic institutions and you will be able to add up all these little accreditations to one bigger uh, degree or certification of sorts. Thank you. Uh, Lara, I think you were the next one that had her hand up, then Costis and oh. then Thank you, Lena. No, I just wanted to point out that um, I think it's maybe a two step system. So it's not so much, I think that we will have a one off transition and that it's going to be um, full of challenges as to how we're going to adapt. I think it's likely that we will possibly have a challenging intermediate phase. Um, but don't forget that along with educational institutions and professors and educators, uh, students are um, also evolving. And I would say they're probably even ahead from uh, educational institutions. So I think that, you know, it, it's probably going to be more difficult for um, local institutions, certainly that are not so, um, let's say, advanced in that sense. But I think our students, I would say, for example, I see a lot of students in Greece in public schools where they may not have um, access to a breadth of classes and opportunities um, are, avid consumers of Coursera courses. I mean, I, you know, I've interviewed kids who um, are in remote areas in Greece and they may have taken 15 courses, for example, from Coursera or edX. Um, and very consciously saying, I don't have many opportunities where I am and this is how I can um, educate myself, give myself a leg up. And that was part of the reason why these uh, institutions were created to provide opportunities to students like that, absolutely. And not just younger students, but older ones too. Yeah, uh, just awesome. in, in a way, it's really the great equalizer. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind. Even though the quality of education, as I said, uh, you, you can get virtually is not the same that you can get in person. So uh, it gives, it provides opportunity for everybody, but it's not necessarily an equalizer because it's not the same caliber. Maybe. Kosti, I think you were the one that had raised his hand next. Would you like to share a comment or ask a question? Thank you, Lena. Congratulations for the excellent uh, presentation. It really moved our mind to think about what's coming next to education. What I wanted to add uh, as a point for further discussion is that uh, it's kind of uh, black humor that our university is one of the few that have the New York uh, inside the title. So it's very global, but actually very local as well in the same moment. 
And I was thinking when, uh, when the lockdown was on in Manhattan, that the viable houses were almost uh, all empty uh, without students inside. So it's a kind of a big um, fight between the deserts of Wi-Fi where it's slow and the deserts where the subway has no connection. So more students could actually uh, move to New York and study in Columbia and find a cheap apartment far away in Brooklyn if they can only commute twice uh, per week to the uh, campus in Morningside. So I think that uh, I know from uh, my school that the, the, the law school admitted students for the first time in history in January instead of uh, uh, September or end of August. So I think that the, uh, things will change but uh, I'm, I'm confident that our alma mater has a very big advantage that uh, we only have one campus. So, so it can be, it's easier to make things international when you are a very centralized in one place. Okay, not one campus, but a few places inside uh, one island. And uh, I'm, I'm confident that a few years from now, your presentation uh, will will be applied to many things in education, but as everything in life, we will we cannot even imagine how actually uh, they will affect our uh, our lives uh, as the students will graduate from uh, from COVID years. So in ten years from now, we'll see doctors graduating uh, when they studied uh, part of this uh, of their syllabus uh, through through Zoom. Uh, pilots will have the same experience, so we, we will we will make it work as always. Thank you, Kosti. Um, I think that our university, yes, is uh, Columbia in New York, but at the same time, we have our global centers uh, that are doing an absolutely wonderful job, and uh, we, we are reaching out to the world uh, in a two-way communication through our global centers. Um, I'd like to make just before, I think we have question um, uh, for one or two more questions. Paul, you will let us know, but I just want to say uh, very, very quickly, because both uh, Paul and Costis mentioned uh, the internet deserts. Um, personally, I'm not as concerned um, with those deserts for, for a simple reason, not because it's not important today, it's crucial today, and you can't be an equalizer unless everybody has internet, but I believe that that problem will be um, fixed in the next few years. I, I, I expect that we will have um, space shuttles going around uh, the globe, uh, around the earth that will assure that everybody has internet. So over the next few years, I believe that that is not going to be a, a problem anymore. Um, I think the next person who had raised her hand was Lefki. I think, um, I think Lena, if it's possible to have the, the two people to say, ask their last two questions together, um, and then you can answer it would probably be the best. These will be the last two questions we'll be able to take, uh, not to take anything away from the people who are raising their hands. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. Lefki? I don't have a question, actually. Thank you very much for your insights. It was uh, actually something I would like to add, but uh, <laughs> because this was your question. And uh, the only thing I would like to add, and what I believe, is that uh, now universities are more, uh, should be more present than ever, because your ed units, I love the word, Okay, it's the only way to be alive and efficient today and tomorrow. And because we are going, our generation, the next generations, they're going to work up to 75 or 80 years old. The uh, universities should find solutions flexible, not only for moms and dads, but also for grandmas and grandpas. Okay, because they have a very uh, solid experience, which on which they could capitalize new knowledge. Uh, and uh, be very, very efficient. This is something I would like to add. Thank you very much. I totally agree. Lifelong learning includes grandmas and granddads and great grandmas and great granddads. Yorgo, the last question is yours. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's an honor. Thank you so much for the presentation. As long as I saw, I found it really, really interesting. So, uh, the question is whether you guys or anyone uh, from the audience, but also you, Lena, uh, 
Do you know of any uh, resources or any uh, tools that can also uh, that um, that can assess uh, soft skills uh, that are used also in uh, in uh, higher education? Uh, this is something that we are working on right now. With uh, I, I'm I'm a bit ashamed to say with Brown University <laughs> we have a, a partnership as as hundred no, mentors. It's perfect, Yorgo. It's okay. It's yeah. I, I wish that we could uh, we could reach uh, you know Colombia, but I think it, it's going to happen. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the question is that we we got to the point that we have micro crediting for uh, hard skills, exactly as you pointed out, Lena, with uh, Coursera, with uh, different different MOOCs. Uh, you get to have these those certifications, but uh, we are struggling a lot to have uh, you know soft skills assessment and. Uh, uh, that, that's the main, the million billion dollar question. And uh, another thing that I would like to add to the discussion that we might find useful is that um, uh, surprisingly enough, there is a, an amazing education technology community in Greece uh, with uh, companies like uh, Hack the Box, Learn Worlds, um, uh, uh, Talent LMS, uh, and uh, of course, okay, 100 Mentors is one of them. And we communicate a lot and the trend that we see is that uh, the, those are we are commercial applications but we are lacking of academic backing so it is super important for higher education institutions to uh, co collaborate and we or we go and collaborate with uh, those institutions to to research to back uh, to make research back uh, applications and I think there is so much space on that side that we haven't explored yet. But yeah, I'll, I'll stick to the question. And thank you so much with the, uh, for, for the presentation and the opportunity, Lena. Thank you, Yorgo. That was a very insightful. I think you just hit the hammer, uh, you know, on, on the nail, on the head of the nail with what you're saying. Um, that's why I think it's going to take some time and the changes are not going to come as soon as possible. Uh, it's because nobody can really assess soft skills. It's one we can uh, we cannot actually put put a grade or evaluate them. Uh, so uh, to the best of my knowledge, there is no tool yet that is reliable. Um, but I know that a lot of effort uh, is being put into um, finding such a tool in the two MOOCs, the two biggest MOOCs. So Coursera and edX are working on that. Uh, and I know that uh, the people who did the uh, meta study that I showed earlier from the World Economic Forum are also spending a lot of time and effort um, in trying to develop uh, tools like that. So it could, you know, we could reach out to them to see if they have come up with something. Unfortunately, everything that uh, we have come up so far um, has been in a way primitive uh, and subjective. There's no objective way of evaluating uh, soft skills. You can measure it, but it's not. It's not objective. I hope that we can. And I trust that eventually we will because it will become such an important part and you will have to take soft skill courses. Um, so, so we will find a way to assess it eventually. Um, Paul, I think that we have already exceeded our time limit by three minutes. I think this was a very insightful and I think everyone here should get an ed unit uh, for, for joining. I don't, if we paid extra 12 or $15, we could get a piece of paper maybe, but I think that we really had a wonderful experience and I really thank you, Lena, from everyone. Everyone's saying so many thank yous through the chat messages. So uh, thank you for your time and thank you for joining. And I look forward to the next uh, program that we can share together. Thank you, everybody, very, very much for your time. I don't take it for granted and really appreciate it. Take care. Thank you, Paul. For Thank hosting. you very much. Thank you, Lena. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. Lena.